It's such a pleasure to have what's a guy who's become a good friend here of late, uh, prolific golfer in his own right, uh, now a broadcaster par excellence, Steve Scott on this On The Mark podcast and video wise for the first time too. Steve, uh, welcome man. How are you doing? Uh, it's always great to be with you and I learn so many great new words when I get to talk to you. So, and I love the accent, whole thing. I can't wait, uh, can't wait to chat with you. <laughs> yeah, why is it that people talk about the words I use? Anyways, um, using words and uh, pictures. Let's let's put you into context, please. Um, the Steve Scott I knew was the guy I watched on television, who was this gritty competitor, um, who, who who took Tiger essentially to the rack. You've got a book that you're releasing here shortly too. I want you to talk about. But for our global audience, please, please tell us a little bit about you you and who you are and how you came to where you are right now. Wow. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I had a pretty good amateur career. I, I was good kind of half a lifetime ago and, and ran into Tiger Woods in that U.S. amateur final that I'm sure we'll chat about soon. But mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I soon realized I played six years professionally and realized that my life, uh, it was going to be tough trying to make a living playing professional golf. So I became a PGA club professional. I uh, got my class A status back in 2007 and uh, became a head professional in 2009. I carried a couple of head professional jobs at a couple of traditional clubs up in the Northeast, uh, New Jersey, New York for about nine years. And now I'm involved with a club that's a national golfing society that doesn't really own real estate. We just run events all around the country and have a great membership who really appreciates the game and the traditions of the game. It's called the Outpost Club. And, all right. and we've also developed a competitive offshoot of that called the Silver Club Golfing Society. So involved with that is like the broadcasting you mentioned. I've authored a book. I try to play competitively within the Carolinas PGA section. So uh, a lot of balls juggle in the air, but uh, I try to keep them all going the right direction. Well, the common thread is golf. I, I want to ask you this. Um, you know, you're now a mentor and advisor and a coach to many. Um, for the parents listening to this, they're like, all right, we remember Steve. We know Steve. Uh, we've got this young man or this young lady, son, daughter, who's wanting to get into golf, you know, go to college, perhaps. You had the decorated career down there at Florida. Um, the, the insights, how did you get into where you are? How did you get into the game first off? And then what's the insight you could share with the parents just listening to this about mentoring and maybe advising the young, the young golfer in the family? Well, great question. I think that whole, that whole arena has changed dramatically in the last, in the last 25 years with, um, with a lot of people getting involved with college placement and, mm -hmm. and all of that for me, um, I just took to the game at a young age. Uh, my, you know, we, my parents were members at a club only for a couple of years. So for most of my life, I was a public course kid. I uh, just, you know, I grew up in South Florida, the Fort Lauderdale area and, and just really took to the game. I loved, I guess I loved the individualness of the game because I didn't have to rely on somebody passing me the ball or whatnot. Mm -hmm. And so I just kind of ran with it. Uh, and my parents were divorced when I was young. And really, I think that, you know, that really played into me getting really diving into golf even more because golf was really my friend at a certain point in my eighth grade year. We moved uh, kind of far away, uh, moved with my mom and my stepfather. Uh, we moved to the northwest corner of Arkansas, of all places, from, all right. okay. from South Florida. And um, anyway, I didn't really have any friends there. And I was only there for a year. And so golf was really my friend. And so I really just dove into golf and and started getting pretty proficient at it. Uh, my sophomore year of high school, I, I won the state high school championship in Florida against some really good competition. I did it again my senior year. But really, I guess to get, get to your question of, of how, that, how I got into it, really, I just, I don't know, I just kind of dove into it. I love the competition, I think. And that's something maybe you can't teach. Uh, the, 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 the competitive drive that a lot of junior golfers have um, really has to come from within. And sometimes I've seen parents in the past try to force that competition on their kids. And uh -huh. I have kids now too. And so, so it's, it's um, you know, it's, it's just one of those things where it's like, I've kind of backed off almost on purpose because I know that, you know, the competition's in our, in my kid's blood. And so, you know, just kind of letting them do what they want to do. And, uh, but it really can't be forced on by the parents. I think that's probably the biggest <laughs> lesson 
and <laughs> and be, and and it's you know it's kind of difficult, right? It's oh, it's well, uh, uh, it's you, difficult to hold back, but yeah, it is. I'm I'm sitting here as a dad, fellow dad as well, and I've got a daughter who plays nicely, um, and and so I'm I'm going to back that observation of yours up with another question to say, look, you know, you let them be. I I know the tightrope you're currently walking right now because of the competitor within. Uh, I know it must be hard to, uh, you know, stand on the sideline and and not get all g'd up and and be more father than competitor. Am I right in this? Uh, it is. It is. It's that. It's a. It's really a conscious thing for me to just kind of to to back off a little bit, try to spoon feed some things. But I I, I think that's the biggest thing. Is just you know support your kids and support them and and. But but make sure you don't cross that line of being pushy and and you know if they're if they're going to gravitate towards it if they have it within them to do it they will do it and that's that's really how I got into the game and it just I just kind of went that way and I just loved the competition I loved being able to challenge challenging myself trying to beat my own personal best score mm -hmm. every day I went out there trying to make one more birdie or hit one more drive a, a little farther and. Uh, and beat some older older kids at that point when I was young, and I, I think that that's the that's the stuff that comes from within. And for me, it was just kind of this innate sort of thing that allowed me to go out there and and compete at a high level at a relatively young age. And that U.S. Amateur I played in the finals against Tiger, it was I was 19 years old, and really back backpedaling before that, a year prior, I played I got to the semifinals of the, of the U.S. Amateur at Newport Country Club as well. Mm -hmm. and I was 18 years old so um yeah it's just kind of one of those things I just I love digging out the short game I loved all the challenge of the game and just trying to get better every day you 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 talked about unlocking the competitor within and and I, I sense that when I'm in your presence I I love the you, I, you exude you know the just the competitive aura about you um I want to look at the shadow side of that a little bit and help the competitive golfer listening to this because your career and your resume speaks for itself. The how, dealing with the letdown, you know, the success is one thing. I, I want you to talk a little bit about and, and advise the folks listening to this, the competitors, whether they're just competing for their member guest or for some collegian, maybe, uh, you know, vying for the NCAs or whatever the case might be. Um, dealing with the letdown of it because golf, that's inevitable. Um, I, I want you to advise us and, and maybe share a personal anecdote because I'm sure there were many. I, well, let's go to that match in 96. You know, Tiger pulls the rabbit out of the hat. You uh, enormously <laughs> benevolent asking him to move his ball mark back. And that's the origin of your book. Um, so let's talk about dealing with a letdown of, of the failure in golf. Well, that's a great perspective, too, because unfortunately in golf you are going to win a heck of a lot more than you or excuse me you're going to lose a heck yeah. of a lot more than you win mm -hmm. i mean even the great tiger woods what he had uh you know at the best you know professionally he had a what a 20 percent win percentage or uh, maybe i'm getting my percentages wrong but you, you're going to lose an awful lot it's kind of like baseball right if you're a 300 batter you're going to be in the hall of fame but that means you strike out seven times out of ten yeah uh, so you're going to fail a heck of a lot more in the game and so yes you have to be prepared to to not win um you have to be prepared to uh lose graciously because it's going to happen a lot and so uh, it's going to happen you have to be almost ready for that more than the victory and mm -hmm. you see that in a lot of players who win sometimes it's almost like they're surprised that they do win but in at the same token i think that i, I don't know i guess the the and maybe i'm going off on the the other tangent here but I think that that when people win, or like like when you you have to go out there trying to win. I think yeah. Um, and because I think there's there's people that hey, if I'm satisfied with a top ten or a top twenty, you don't take the risks that are involved with winning. You have to. I look back at every win that I've had as a junior golfer or as a, a collegian or a professional. And there was one or two shots that I look back and say, why the heck did I do that? Like the statistics didn't really say that I should pull that shot off, but, right. but my goal was, my goal was to win. And so I really, uh, I, I had to take that risk, but with that risk comes the responsibility of, of owning up to a mistake. If you don't, uh, if you don't pull it off. And so you, you have to, uh, I guess, a, appreciate those risks that you take and, 
and be ready to uh, be ready to succumb to the failure if if it if it doesn't get that way. But I think the 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 failure is certainly a part of it. Um, it's not the fun part of it, but it's the unfortunate reality of of golf because there are so many competitors that you play against uh, every time. And I think that's for me. That's why I was better in match play as opposed to stroke play because I only had to beat one other guy, and so. Mm-hmm you know, making it to the finals of the U S amateur for me, maybe didn't seem so difficult because every day I only had to beat one person. Yeah, I, I don't you. have to beat 155 other players. And so, uh, may, maybe I answered your question. Maybe I didn't, but, uh, no, no, um, you, you said you certainly did. Um, I've, I've got thousands of questions that are now bobbing around in my head. Um, what I do want to ask is the failure you reference and you talk about you know the, the taking on the, inev- the the risk required to to hit that shot re- you know that might be necessary to pull off the victory um what about the did the after the letdown of it you know that picking oneself up uh, did you give yourself like a time to bemoan the fate or just kind of you know feel a bit sorry for yourself or whatever the case might be and then say okay that's that now i'm going to look forward or or was this just a natural thing with Steve Scott, just the competitor within Zach. Like, okay, well, I got beat. I'm out to get the next guy. Well, yeah, that, that's a good point. I mean, I think specifically talking, you know, touching on that 96 US amateur where everybody knew that, hey, that I, you know, I didn't win. I was the runner up that day. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess for me, I took the positives away from it as much as I could. Uh, certainly it was a, it was a bummer not to capture that Habermeyer trophy at, that I had, you know, one hand on, or even more, really. Uh, but <laughs> yeah. you know, it it, it, it was, um, you know, I took the positives away from it. Number one, when you when when I was going into the finals of that USAM, I knew that I was playing in the Masters. I knew I was going to at least get an invite into the Masters the next spring. So that was a total victory in itself. Mm-hmm. Um, and then I was uh, soon after that match, like later that day. I was named to the world amateur team for the United States. So I got to represent my country with three other guys. I mean, so, uh, I mean, that was a total victory there. Um, I I ended up getting invites into numerous PGA tour events because of that moment. Um, So there was, you know, other than winning the event that day for me, there were so many positives that came out of it. And I think even just the average event that you don't win doesn't have to be the U S amateur that you finish runner up at or finish top 10. Um, I think you, you always have to take those positives. If you're going to play this game for a long time, have the longevity that, you know, all the golfers want who play competitively, you're going to, to have to always look at those positives and, and move forward. Because if you're looking back, I think it's the, the Dustin Johnson sort of mentality, just like, he probably doesn't remember what he ate for breakfast, you know, like <laughs> just, it just, he just puts it, he uh-huh. just, he just, he just goes forward. And I think yeah. if, if everybody could take the Dustin Johnson approach to the, to the mind game, I think that that's, that's probably the best advice that, that I could give. Never look back, always look forward, always take the positives of what you did. If you are happen to looking back, but mm-hmm. there, there, you have to look at it that way. Cause if you look at it from a de- defeatist standpoint, you're going to be defeated pretty quickly. Hey, uh, I, I was lucky um, to walk, work alongside you calling the 21 um, World Golf Championships Dell match play. And you, you're the match play expert. And I was, you know, the stand-in host when, when I wasn't doing my analyst jobs. And, and you made that point at one stage. And I remember it sort of sitting with my spirit and you're like, all right, every hole. Now we're talking match play for folks here. Now stroke play, it's essentially the same deal if you think about it, but every holes, it's an own contest. And then once the contest is done, it's onward and there's no looking backward. And, and I was like, man, this is the truth. And you said it so beautifully. Um, let's build on that a little bit more because I think even for the stroke play folks listening to this, there, there's this, this beauty like Dustin Johnson, you point out of always being mentally one step ahead and not ever looking in the rear view. Right. So here's the, here's the picture that that all of the players when you play golf this is what you have to to visualize you when you leave the green you hold out your putt you're walking off the green you have to picture that there's a door right off of the side of the green you you open the door and you close it and you walk through it but by the time you get to the next tee you know there's a little bit of gap in between that green and that tee once you get to the next tee there's another door and you you open that door up and then you close that and you move on to the next hole. And, and 
by that time, you can't look back. You can't see through those doors that you just went through. And now you, you, you move forward. And I, I think that that's the, the visualization of, of that practice of just, you know, whatever it is that you, you just have to close that door and move on. And, you know, again, learn from what you did. If you made a, a dumb mental mistake, certainly, you know, write that down in your notes and, and, and utilize that for future reference. But, but don't take the negatives and don't look back at, man, I, I should have done this or I three putted two holes ago and, and I'm going to three putt again or something. It's, it's an easy mentality and mindset to get in, but it, it, the positivity and that closing the door is something you have to mentally practice. That's what the psych, sports psychologist would say. And, uh, you know, you utilize that because golf, I think, I think most golfers think that, man, if I have this picture perfect golf swing, and we see it all the time on social media, people putting beautiful golf swings on social media. And you're like, why doesn't this guy win? And you wonder why they finish 30th in the tournament. It's like, cause golf swing and the technique itself is, is only one spoke of the wheel or only one piece of the pie. And so you, 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 if you understand it in that respect and you understand the mental game is, is as or more important than the beauty of the physical game, man, now you've, now you've really got something. And I think that that's, if you look at my golf swing back in 1995, 1996, technically it wasn't anything that was special, but what got me through those moments and what got me to tackle the, the greatest player of our generation in Tiger Woods was just that, that the heart and the guts and the, the, the never wavering desire to win. And I think that that's, uh, that's really what carried me. I'm, I'm writing feverishly here right now. And, and I raised my <laughs> hands earlier when, when you were talking about that subject, because it is so true. And, and, and I want to, because I want to talk about, in your opinion, the keys to being a good competitor, you know, that that's how we're going to help the uh, listener and the viewer to this now. Um, but I want to, let's, let's, let's go and visit um, 1996 uh, pumpkin Ridge. Um, the, the final of the U.S. amateur match play. Tiger Woods is on the doorstep of his professional career. Um, hell, you guys had a gallery there that rivaled anything, anywhere. Um, so, so let's reminisce a little bit. Walk us through the day a little. Uh, but before you do that, I, I want to, you had, the big, you had the big lead after 18 holes. Then he chips away a little bit. And then you pitch in the shot on 10. The, to this day, I can still remember. I mean, you were essentially had nothing there. <laughs> And you pull the rabbit out of the hat, you knock this thing down, they pan to him and he sort of almost doesn't flinch, but they keep the camera on you and your girlfriend, now your wife, right? Yeah. You guys go and stand on the side of the green. And I remember you going, and you took this big breath and they zoomed in on your face and you sort of looked up at the heavens as if to say, what the heck, you know? And then I could mm -hmm. see you going, okay. And, I, and you were trying to sort of calm yourself down so you could go through that next door. I mean, am I reaching over you? Or was this the truth? No, no, not reaching at all. No, I mean, I think at that moment, uh, you know, the amount of adrenaline that went through my body at that one moment, I mean, I was wearing these heavy leather foot joys and I felt <laughs> I, I jumped higher than Michael Jordan. Like, like I was, uh, my feet were so light and I was able, man, I just jumped through the roof. Um, and yes, you, you, it's this surge of electricity that goes through your body. It's kind of like that, that flight or fight response that you get in a danger situation or a pressure situation or something where, man, it just, it, you have to calm yourself down. Cause if you don't, cause you have to, you know, in golf, you can't like, you know, go tackle somebody or check somebody into the boards. Like you have to, you know, you have to execute a golf shot and, and, you know, uh, finite moments. And, and so, yes, you, you have to just kind of, take that breath and, and get your heart rate back to somewhere where it's calm. Because if you don't, you're probably going to pass out. <laughs> what a thrill. Okay. <clears throat> Let's go to the night before you win your semi. Um, you look at the draw and you're like, I got Tiger Woods tomorrow. Um, the, the preparation that goes into the day. I think there's so much that people can learn from this because naturally I would assume that Steve Scott is a little nervous. You obviously got a lot of anticipation going on. Talk about, the preparation the night before leading into the final? Well, it was just, it was a total mind preparation. I mean, that's all it was. Physically, my game was totally on point. I mean, the hole looked as big as a peach basket. I was rolling it great. I was hitting the ball in the fairways, which you had to do. We had thick, thick USGA rough. Um, it was just that perfect USGA setup, firm fairways, 
firm greens running at least 12 on the stem. And, um, but it was, it was a mindset that I needed. And it was a, I had a really serendipitous pairing about eight months before I played with Tiger in a collegiate event um, at Palmetto Dunes near Hilton Head. Mm -hmm. And we were paired together and I, I watched his game. We both played, it was the final round of the event and he went and shot two under par it was like, it was a piece of cake and I shot 80. And the reason why I shot 80 that day was because I was caught up in his game. I was watching these towering three irons from 250 over ponds to par fives that I couldn't even sniff. And so I'm like, man, like I was really caught up in watching him because I'd never played with him before. I wanted to see what this Tiger Woods was all about. And, mm -hmm. and I got to see it. And so fast forward eight months later to that USAM final. I mean, it, the, the strategy that night was all about not watching him hit a golf shot. I mean, I would literally look up in the trees. I would uh, look at the ground. I wouldn't watch him hit a golf shot. The only thing I might watch was maybe for a wind direction or, but, and you certainly couldn't avoid the sound of his golf ball coming off the driver. It was like a gunshot, right? I remember so, you talking about that, yeah. Oh, I mean, so, so anyway, that was my mindset. And, and, and then, you know, I get to that morning and we're walking down the first hole and so I learned a lot. Of, it, it was really interesting. If any of your listeners have watched The Last Dance, the Michael Jordan thing in the last year, that was that 10-part series. One of the things that I really took from that, that I look back on mine, that I used to my benefit, was what, what Jordan always did was he would try to find motivation. Even if motivation wasn't ever present, he would try to find something and tap into that to, to, to fuel the fire in his mm -hmm. belly and at every point during the game. And so for me, I, I did that instinctively. So I was walking down the first hole, 7.15 in the morning, we both tee off, hit the fairway and walking down the first hole, he's about 15 yards ahead of me. I turned to Christy, my girlfriend, now wife, like you mentioned. And, and I said, Hey, he doesn't have a sports psychologist caddying for him who had Jay Bronzer, who had caddied yeah. for him in mm -hmm. all of his previous USGA victories. And he was his buddy, Brian Bell from high school. And, and I said, uh, I turned to Christy. I said, he doesn't have a sports psychologist caddy for him. I'm going to crush this guy. He doesn't have his security blanket with him. And, and that was my mindset. And I was, and I was, I was dead fat, dead, dead uh, sure that I was going to crush him that day because of that. And, <laughs> um, and that's how I was able to play so well. I, I used something really that I just made up to fuel my fire. And I think a guy like Brooks Kepka nowadays does mm -hmm. that, uh, you know, you play with that chip on your shoulder. I think that that's, that's a very important mindset to, to use when you're out there. It's a 36 hole final for the folks who aren't familiar with it. Same as the British amateur. Um, I believe you five up going into the turn. Um, <laughs> then there's an interesting anecdote I saw in one or other news clipping or something where you and Christy went shopping in merchandising and Tiger and all of his uh, entourage <laughs> were work grinding away on the range. Uh, tell us that story. We did. We did. Yeah. I mean, like I said, my, my physical game was so good. I mean, I was just on this autopilot playing so great. So I didn't have to do, I didn't have to, you know, all I had to do was warm up for 10 or 15 minutes before we were ready to go back out. We had a 90 minute intermission, mind you, uh, which is, we, and I go into this in the book a little bit, but that's, you know, it's more than double than a Super Bowl halftime. And so yeah. a lot of things can change in 90 minutes. Um, but, but yes, for, from that story, particularly Tiger was off his game, his, his posture was off and he had his whole team there and, you know, he needed a whole team and I had my girlfriend. Right. And so, um, and we went and we said, Hey, let's, let's make sure we have something to remember this week by. And uh, so, you know, she said, hey, let's go shopping. And it was a great way for her mm -hmm. to, to try to get my mind off of that moment. She's always been a great sports psychologist for me. And she's an, she's an LPGA teaching yeah. professional herself to this day. And but um, yeah, it was it was just that kind of that moment that I needed to get my mind out of the game and into something totally different just for a moment because I didn't need to go practice. I mean, there was no need to do that. Hey, okay, then you guys get back in the golf course. He steadily sort of chips away at your lead and narrows it to two, I think it was, with nine to go. Um, and, and I remember in that broadcast you and I were on where I spoke of playing with a big lead and how it's difficult. It's more difficult than people think because you don't have that chaser's freedom, if you will. And we saw yep. it in the Masters here in 2021 where Decky had the big lead and didn't fumble it away, mm -hmm. but, you know, things changed a little bit. 
Talk about your mindset there as you're going along, you're five up, all of a sudden you're four up, and then you're three. And uh, I, yeah. I, I want to tap into the competitor's mind over there. T- share, share a secret or two on an insight, please. Well, I, well, I, look, I look back and say, look, because I'm five up, and I, I shot two under par in the second 18. I mean, I played well. It's not like okay. I bogeyed my way around and just let him in. I, I forced Tiger to pull Tiger things out of his hat. And, mm-hmm. and he did. He shot seven under par in that second 18. And we ended up going to two playoff holes. But um, so I didn't really give it away. But the mindset really going out, look, if I'm, if I, if, shoot, if I'm like, if we just tie all the front nine, right? If, if I don't give him a hole, I'm going to be five up with nine to play. I'm going to win that match. Yeah. And so Tiger came out really quickly and he flagged a couple shots early on in that first 18, second 18. Um, and I, I, I missed a, a, a par putt from like five feet on another hole. And then all of a sudden you're right. I'm, I'm only, I'm only two up. Mm-hmm. Uh, he chipped away really quickly. And so, mm-hmm. and actually after through nine holes through that 27th hole, of the match, he got it. Uh, he was only he was only one down. He made a great birdie on the on the twenty seventh hole, okay. and then we had that kind of that back and forth fight. I hit that flop shot in. He holds a big eagle putt on the next hole. But but yeah, playing with a lead is you're right. You don't have that that chaser's freedom, but you always have to. It's it's hard to trick your mind that hey, you know, just to try to keep the pedal down because you know that in that point, you know, halves of the hole. You know, if you tie each hole, you're probably going to win that match. And so mathematics say you win. So it's, um, you, you, you know, yes, there is a tension because yes, you're, you, you know, that, uh, uh, history is on the line for him. And, and he, he just, he came out and played unbelievable and, and I didn't play, I played pretty well (laughs) and it's, you know, it's, it's happened throughout, throughout, uh, the last 25 years with him. And Phil Mickelson or VJ Singh or Ernie Els or whoever he came back and yeah. beat. But uh, yeah, I mean, that day was, uh, that was something that day. You're so humble. <laughs> I, I, I want to talk about the ball marking <laughs> incident. Um, but when we talk about the book, just to wrap this, but um, you talk about the Tiger things. He hold a couple of putts there coming down the stretch. And the one was that just insane um, slider up and over a slope from outside of 40 feet had like, yeah, you, you, yeah. They panned to you and you were like, really, are you serious? And he's giving it the tiger (laughs) thing. Uh, (laughs) Just to share this. I thought his arm was going to come out of its socket, you know? (laughs) Quick, uh, quickly share the story. I I can't remember what hole it was, but to this day, (laughs) it's still, uh, you know, the the arm thing that he was doing. Yeah, that. that Yeah, that one, well, yeah, it kind of goes and ties in with that birdie he made on the 27th, my flop shot on the 28th, and then he comes right back and holds this monster eagle putt that I'm in there about three feet for birdie, like it's a par five, yeah. and he hit this six iron up over the trees, it comes down like, like a, a landed like a butterfly with sore feet on the green and the firm greens that were there, and, and he holds this putt, it had like, it had three or four feet of break, and the break was very late in the putt. And it was, it was more. Come on, no. I, I, I've just set it up as I ten. Mean, it looked like ten foot. <laughs> it was. It was nuts. This putt was. This putt was a good 30, 35 feet that he hold, and and then he. So you know he could have three putted half the time. It was that difficult of a putt, and um, yeah, I, he just he just kept doing that, and um, man, that that one moment was that was pretty nuts. But yes, and he gave it the full like you know it was this punch counter punch sort of moment. I think that's what made that match so epic it was this you know not only had all these storylines you know from my girlfriend caddying to tiger going for history i mean it was this 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 great play that you just like it was this theater that you couldn't mat you couldn't script it in a movie you couldn't yeah uh, it's worthwhile. I don't know if it's on YouTube. If it is, folks, you're going to go check out 1996 <laughs> yes. US Amateur Final. Uh, yes, I'm it's, certain it's, it's, g- it's everywhere. <laughs> given it's Tiger, given it's Tiger, I'm sure it's there. Um, okay, Steve, before we talk about the book, I did uh, sort of tee you up a little bit. Just as, in terms of like headlines or subject headers or whatever, just three for the listener, three takeaways to be a better competitor. Um, you don't have to dive into it. Just sort of just, just touch on each one. Number one, do you have something like that for us? Yeah. I mean, I, I think number one, you, you have to love the heat of competition. I mean, you okay. have to love that. You can't shy away from that. Um, love, love being in the most pressure moment that you can be in. I think that that you have to embrace that. If you don't embrace that, I think it's going to be, it's tough to be a, 
a top shelf competitor. And um, it, does it get more comfortable the more you're in that environment? Because I know that is hugely uncomfortable for everyone the first time they're in there. It is for sure. I mean, it's like anything. It's like being a great broadcaster like you are. You have to uh, get out there and get the reps and you have mm -hmm. to you know, get in there and understand the flow of the, the broadcast or the flow of the round or the tournament itself. And so the more that you understand that, the more that it becomes second nature for sure. I, I know the first time I ever played in the U.S. Uh, US junior amateur in match play, I was nervous out of my mind and I didn't play my game. And, and then later on in match play, a couple of years later, I played very freely and very easily because I had that experience. Okay. All right. So love the heat of competition. Mm -hmm. Two? Yep. Number two? Two, I, I guess it would be, um, I would say play more than you practice. Get out there oh, on the golf that. course mm -hmm. and get it, get into, you know, if you're practicing on the range, look, you have this pretty golf swing. Okay. It's only good for a flat lie. What happens when you have, the uphill lie or the downhill lie or the, the golf, the, the round of golf. It's amazing. You could play a 72 hole tournament and not have the same situation or the same lie. It, 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 it duplicated at all. Um, the same break of a putt, the same speed of the green. One day you're playing the morning, one day you're playing the afternoon. Um, so you have to get out there and play and understand the, the arena, which your golf game has to adapt. Mm -hmm. I think that that's the biggest thing that you can, you can take away from, from that and getting out because practice, it only does you so much good, but getting out there to, to play and in competition to play, I think, uh, you know, is even better, but definitely play more than you practice. I love that. And you're so right about well, to me and all of my experiences around the top golfers, watching them up close in the heat of battle, the ability to adapt, I think is the biggest separator of all. Uh, okay. Put a capstone on it. What's number three. I would say, and this is this is from a long time of, uh, of maturity, and now if I took my mindset back, uh, um, if I can take my mindset I have now back to my you know nineteen or twenty year old days, I would say just be be your own best friend out there, be your own caddy, uh, be you know give yourself so many pep talks and good positive messages all the time. Uh, when things aren't going well in the golf course, it's easy to get negative uh it's easy to to act in a negative way or walk with your shoulders slumped or have good positive uh uh, uh body language i think body language is huge you know walk mm. with your shoulders shoulders up your chin high even if you've made three bogeys in a row you know the 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 cortisol or the the thing that the things that go through your brain yeah. when you have that positive body language are uh, are so beneficial that you don't realize. And so be your own best friend out there and, and, and do the things to keep your mind right throughout, throughout the play. Because it's easy, again, it, you're going to fail more than you succeed in this game. So you have to find ways to, to trick your brain to know that you're always succeeding. You are preaching, brother Steve. Okay, folks, <laughs> um, this was given to me a few weeks ago by the guy on the screen, Steve Scott. And it is a very cool ball mark. I keep it in my golf bag. Um, and it was a little tease for your book. Um, the writing's too small for me to make re read it out now. But the book debuts in the springtime. Uh, quickly, just, yeah, yeah. it's, I, I think the event, quickly t tell us about the event. I've kept you for a long time. And tell folks where they can find the book, please. Uh, well, you can find the book is entitled, Hey Tiger, You Need to Move Your Mark, mark Back. Mm -hmm. And uh, it comes out May 18th and uh, you can go on move that back.com right now and pre-order the book. And I've got a bunch of pre-orders coming in already. Oh. And I will personally mm -hmm. sign the book to whoever you want. Uh, and, and you'll also get a really cool, uh, I've got a very similar ball marker to that, that I'll include in the purchase, uh, kind of a commemorative marker. And uh, so yes, uh, hop on, move that back. And uh, keep keep abreast of my social media handles at S Scott PGA uh, on Instagram and Twitter, and you'll learn a lot about that. But movethatback.com and uh, get yourself in the pre-order queue and and get that book. It's really fun. Um, it's great great history lesson. Really, it's a great junior golf lesson. It's a great lesson for anybody who wants to really be reminded of the greatness of the game. And I think that that's uh, you know in that moment uh, was was just that. 
Okay, quickly, um, we need to send one to Tiger. Uh, just kidding. Um, the the moment on, yeah. on, the, on the golf course, what part of that match was it? Because Tiger, you know, he was about to hit a putt without moving the ball mark back, and you did something yeah. that would make Bob Jones, my hero, very proud. Well, it's very kind of you to say. It was really an instinctive reflex action for me. Um, it was the 34th hole of the match, and I was two up with three to play. Uh -huh. And the, the match was on the line. I win this hole, I win the match. And Tiger hit a great second shot in there. I missed the green in the bunker, pitched out of the bunker. Uh, and I had about a 10 footer for par and he had a six footer for birdie. And I had to make my 10 footer to make his six footer mean anything. And I hold this great putt. I hit a dead center, mm -hmm. uh, made this par, I'm walking off the side of the green. And I noticed, because I had him move his marker because it was directly in my line. And I just noticed that not enough time had elapsed when I was walking off that green. And I kind of looked out the corner of my eye and said, hey, you need to move your mark back. And he had to go stand up, go through the whole process. He was putting his golf ball down in the wrong spot. And anybody knows match play rules. If you play from the wrong spot, the mm -hmm. you automatically lose the hole and the match would have been over. And um, if so you think about that for a second, right? You, and yeah, it's 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 not tooting my horn necessarily. It's tooting the horn of the game of golf, right? Yeah. It's, it's, it's the reason why we all love the game. It's the reason why we all listen to your podcast. It's the reason why we all watch golf incessantly is because golf is sits on this pedestal as compared to other sports. And we police ourselves, we call penalties on ourselves, or at least we should. And um, in that moment, the game was uh, the honor of the game was upheld and if, if it wasn't me, I would hope it would have been somebody else. Hmm. Well, bravo. Great job. I, it's been a pleasure to have you on the show. I appreciate your time and your insights, Steve. Uh, quickly, the folks know where to go and get the book. Share the social media handles again one more time before I let you go. Yeah. Uh, at, at S. Scott PGA at, uh, on Instagram and Twitter. And so on, I'm on LinkedIn, Facebook, all those good things. But uh, yeah, movethatback.com. Get your pre-order of the book and and uh, yeah, get in there and, and learn, learn a little about the uh, history of the game. Steve Scott, you're a gem, man. I appreciate you joining us. Oh, thank you, Mark.